Following the death of Pius IX in 1878, the cardinals met again to decide the direction the church would take. As noted at the end of Part 3 of our look at Pius, the cardinals had to decide whether to choose a candidate who would stay rigidly locked in the past and follow the path laid out by Pius, or elect a moderate who would look to the future and the new reality of a liberal, secular Italy without the Papal States. Yet again, despite the Vatican's hollow claims of independence and superiority to secular rule, the three Catholic countries of France, Austria, and Spain all vetoed the choice of a zealous cardinal, Luigi Obilio, who had been one of the principal crafters of the Syllabus of Heirs and a chief proponent of infallibility. In the end, the cardinals voted for the initially moderate candidate who became Leo XIII. Yet, two days after his first anniversary as Pope, Leo surprised many with his unexpected and forceful call for the restoration of the Papal States. One of the biggest insults to papal pride occurred in what Kurtzer termed the symbolic completion of Italian unification, the erection of a statue in memory of Giordano Bruno in 1889. In 1884, students at the University of Rome launched an international call for funds to create the monument, an appeal which met with resounding success not only financially, but included signatories to the petition from the scientific and literary giants of the age. By June 1886, having collected more than needed, the organizers submitted a formal petition to erect the statue in the Campo di Fiori where Bruno had been brutally burned alive in 1600. The church, of course, felt offended by this insult, yet popular support for Bruno's monument grew daily. A prominent leftist parliamentarian, Giovanni Bovio, noted the people's backing came from the fact that Bruno's sacrifice was a mysterious and execrable crime for which the church must settle its account with history. On June 9, 1889, 10,000 people from all over Italy came to witness the unveiling and pay their respects to this martyr for free thought, and Kurtzer writes that 2,000 organizations were represented. Despite there being no physical threat to the Pope from the thousands of Bruno supporters in Rome, Leo invited his nuncios to be with him and provide comfort during the unveiling. On June 30th, Leo pitifully bemoaned the insult and underlying threat of Bruno's statue to his office in a formal address to the cardinals known as a papal allocution, complaining that our own person is in danger, the most profound humiliation of its spiritual head and of its see, reinforced by the monument glorifying apostasy and impiety. In October 1890, Leo reiterated his wounded pride in an encyclical. To enchain a new reason and free thought, this is the defining statement of the Vatican mentality and its historical intransigence to thinking, reason, and liberty that persists to this day. Then, in November 1893, Leo issued another encyclical attacking the rationalists, true children and inheritors of the older heretics, who were using the modern techniques of textual criticism to deconstruct and contextualize the Bible. Leo demonstrated the obscurantist mentality repeatedly seen in encyclicals, dictating the use of presuppositional apologetics to biblical studies rather than applying proper scholarship. Leo's reasoning for this approach becomes apparent further in the document, quoting, But since the divine and infallible magisterium of the Church rests also on the authority of Holy Scripture, Leo futilely protests the inconvenient truth that scholarly attempts to prove the Bible is a man-made, error-filled collective work and not the divinely written, error-free, sacred text the Church declares it to be as a threat to its claims of authority. Indeed, Leo specifically prohibits 
even the presumption that there can be errors, quoting again, but it is absolutely wrong and forbidden either to narrow inspiration to certain parts only of Holy Scripture or to admit that the sacred writer has erred. Criticizing the unrestrained freedom of thought of the textual critics, Leo concludes with a statement of the attitude characteristic throughout Christian history of intellectual stifling. Let scholars keep steadfastly to the principles which we have in this letter laid down, and that therefore nothing can be proved either by physical science or archaeology which can really contradict the scriptures. Well, then, let's all stick our heads in the sand. Unrelated to the fight over the Papal States, but an interesting side note to the further loss of temporal authority, is another event which happened under Leo's watch on the other side of the world in yet another repudiation of systemic abuses by the Catholic Church. The Philippine Revolution from 1896 to 98 saw Catholic Spain lose control of their Pacific colony along with Guam, Puerto Rico, and Cuba, but it was a lingering and common hatred of the friars that was a key trigger in starting the fight. Just as the monasteries were despised in Europe and closed in many countries during the revolutions, the same dislike of the friar orders was true in the Philippines. For centuries, a parasitic class of idle, entirely Spanish brothers lived off the backs of Filipino farmers on what were known as the friar estates. However, it was not until the intervention of the Americans under the pretext of the Spanish-American War of 1898 that the Spanish were fully defeated. The 1902 Philippine Organic Act removed the Catholic Church as the state religion and the Church and the United States government negotiated the purchase of the friar estates, but despite the mass hatred of the friars, they were not removed from the islands. A future video will be dedicated to this topic and the people, such as Jose Rizal, who were involved in the revolution. If you like my content, please like and subscribe to get notified of new videos. Please also consider supporting my work by becoming a Patreon sponsor. You can also find me on the following platforms.